and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and here is the progress that I made in my game, adding a really interesting mechanic for interplanetary travel. It's been a while since the last devlog, the month of July and the beginning of August were a bit tricky, balancing a YouTube channel and making a game at the same time has definitely been a lot more difficult than I thought. Basically, I've been experiencing what is probably the reality to most of you. Most of you probably have a regular day job and you only work on games on the weekends and evenings, so that is kind of what I've been doing as I developed this game, so this is kind of relatable, I guess. After a few weeks of focusing mainly on videos, lately I've been focusing mainly on the game and I've managed to do quite a bit of progress. I managed to get back to this code base pretty easily. Once again, it's thanks to the power of writing good clean code as well as a nice diagram to help me remember how everything was set up. Because of that, coming back to this code base was pretty easy. I managed to do quite a lot of work in a short amount of time. And I finally managed to implement one of the trickiest mechanics for this game, adding interplanetary travel. This was quite tricky to implement, especially since the game supports both single player and multiplayer. I encountered tons of issues, every time I got it working I found something that completely broke everything, that happened multiple times, but by going through it in the end I got it all working. Hopefully by hearing how I encountered all those issues and managed to fix them, hearing that will be useful to you to remember that when you encounter bugs in your own games that's perfectly normal, that's perfectly part of the process. Even though I do have decades of experience I still get bugs like anyone else. When I write code sometimes it works the first time and sometimes it doesn't, that's perfectly normal. So if you encounter bugs in your own games then don't get frustrated. That doesn't mean that you're bad at programming or game development, that's just a perfectly normal part of building any project. So when I got back to work on the game, I spent some time just working on polishing, and after adding some polish I got to work on adding more serious mechanics, and I focused on the one that I knew was going to be quite complex, adding interplanetary travel. Basically I want the player to be able to move between multiple worlds, the whole idea is to repopulate the entire galaxy with dinkies, so I need the player to be able to go from one world to the next one, but importantly of course I need to not lose the data on that first world. If the player then got back to the first world, everything should still be exactly as they left it. Initially my first thought was pretty simple, why don't I just spawn the entire world off to the side somewhere? Technically that could work, I could have two worlds separated but both running at the exact same time, but that would become really messy really quickly. It would cause all sorts of issues with instance lists and all kinds of UI and visual elements. The game really was made to assume that all of the objects exist in a single world, and of course if I were to take that approach it would just be a matter of time before everything broke due to performance. Just imagine having 10 worlds, all of them running with hundreds of objects at the same time, all of it being networkly synchronized. With all of that, I'm pretty sure it's only a matter of time before everything breaks. So the approach of cloning the world off to the side, that doesn't really work. The approach I ended up taking was simply when I leave a world, save the save state for that world, then load the save state for the other world, then when I come back I can load the save state for this world. In theory, that is one task that sounds relatively straightforward, just basic saving and loading. But building this was actually quite challenging, especially since the game is meant to work in both single player and multiplayer. If it was just single player, this would have been much, much easier to build. So here's my advice to you, if you're a beginner, if you're just starting out, definitely start off with single player games. Don't go into multiplayer until you have a decent amount of experience. Everything is much more difficult in multiplayer. Anyways, before I could even start working on that, I first had to rework the save system. Basically, I needed to update the file in order to be able to store not just one world, but any kind of worlds. And I also need to separate what is world data and global data. For example, for items and dinkies, those exist in a single world, so they should be saved in that world, but other things like the tech tree, that one is meant to be a global unlock, you're not meant to lose all of your unlocks when you go from world A to world B, so some data needs to be on a per world basis and other data needs to be global. I refactored the save file to make sure that everything works correctly, but in doing so I also did not want the game to completely break the saves of anyone who is currently trying out the demo, so I also made sure to add some backwards compatibility. Thankfully this was actually pretty easy. I just kept the old structure directly in the code, then when trying to load it, I'm going to try to load using that type. If it works, then great, it uses that old version, but if it doesn't work, then it loads using the brand new version. And since I was changing the format for the save file, I wanted to make it future proof. I made sure to separate all the data so that I could add more data in various places if I need to. This was another task that normally would be quite difficult, but thankfully was super easy thanks to the power of experience. This is something that I've done several times before. For example, I covered how to do saving and loading onto a file, including some extra data on another video. Here I did the exact same thing. I literally watched my own video to remember how I set that up. So I made a file header, I stored the number of bytes and so on. I separated the file metadata from the actual saved data. And just for fun, I also implemented the logic to be able to store a screenshot. Adding this feature really is a great example of the power of experience. The first time that I implemented something like this, it took me dozens of hours. Trying to figure out how all of this works it included a lot of trial and error, whereas right now it was surprisingly easy. That showcases not just the power of experience, but also one of the reasons why I make videos for this channel. 
all the things that I end up researching for various videos eventually end up being super useful to me in my own projects. Okay, so with that I had the new file structure and I could finally start working on building multiple worlds. The idea is basically save all the current objects into memory, then destroy all those objects, destroy the environment, then unload a brand new environment, and unload the brand new objects for that new world. It's simple in concept, but it did have a bunch of really tricky parts. There were a lot of times when I thought, okay, it's finally working, then I go to test and suddenly find a brand new bug that breaks everything. Like I said, hopefully this is a great practical example to you as to how finding bugs is a perfectly normal part of the game dev process. Sometimes I read comments from people who are a bit frustrated that they write some code and doesn't come out perfect like you see in my videos, but remember in my videos I cut out the mistakes. When you see a tutorial, I'm not going to cover all the various points that I went where things went wrong. I'm just going to cover the things that actually make up the final working product. But that absolutely does not mean that I don't find errors during all my research in building any system. I get those errors just the same as you. The one big difference between myself and a beginner, the difference is that I just don't get frustrated. When something breaks, I simply accept it as perfectly normal and then fix it. And thanks to my many years of experience, every time I see a bug, it's highly unlikely that it's something that I've never seen before. So most of the times when I see a bug, I know exactly how to fix it. And even when I don't know how to fix it, thanks to all my years of experience, I do have quite a bit of nice debugging skills. So I do know what logs I need to make in order to figure out what is the cause of that bug. So that's just a nice tip for you when working on your projects. When something breaks, just relax, that is a perfectly normal part. Just try to improve your debugging skills so the next time you encounter that bug, things will be much easier to fix. Anyway, so yep, adding this multi-world mechanic was really tricky, I found lots of bugs. Here's every step that I took and every problem that I found and how I managed to fix it. First thing I needed was simply to dynamically spawn the world. So rather than having a fixed world on the game scene, instead of that I need to dynamically spawn it depending on what world the player was on. Now the obvious way to do that is just put the world inside a prefab and just spawn that prefab. In single player, this option would work perfectly. But in multiplayer, objects can't really just be instantiated, they need to actually be spawned on the network. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make this prefab a network object and just spawn it. But again, yet another bug. One of the ways due to how netcode for game objects works is you cannot have a child network object as a child of another network object. Since each world also has some resource spawn areas which are supposed to be network objects, because of that, I could not make the parent prefab a network object as well. So the next option was, okay, so don't make the main prefab a network object, just spawn it as a regular object, then go through all the children and spawn them as network objects. And yep, look at that, this approach does work, everything is spawning correctly. But then I went to test with a client, and again, everything broke. It said the client cannot spawn these objects because they are not on the prefab list. This was a really tricky bug that really made me quite confused. If I look at the list, I can see, yep, the object is there, and look at that, the HQ building is exactly there, so why is it that the client does not find it? Well, in this case, it turns out that the answer is when you instantiate the prefab in Unity. When you do that, it actually spawns a copy of the prefab. So after instantiating the object that is on the hierarchy, that one is no longer a direct reference of the original prefab. That one is now a copy that looks exactly like the original prefab. So that meant that as I instantiated the copy of the world, that copy, which contained all of the various network objects that I was trying to spawn, all of those were actually copies and they were not references of the original prefabs that were on the prefab list. So yeah, this took me quite a while to figure out. Like I said, making multiplayer games makes everything much more difficult. All the errors are much more difficult, and importantly, the debugging process that is even more confusing. I made a simple RPC to be able to send the logs from the server to the client in order to verify were they somehow receiving different objects. And because of that, I managed to see that for some reason the hash codes were different despite the fact that they were supposedly the same objects, and that's how I figured out the whole thing about the copying becoming clones of the same prefab. So yeah, this was really tricky, but after finding the cause, the solution is super easy. I just made a super simple script that holds a reference to the original prefab. Then when cycling through the copies, instead of spawning them directly, I'm just going to instantiate the original prefab and spawn that one. So with this change, everything was now working correctly. I could now spawn as both a host and a client, and everything would work perfectly. However, when I tried to move to a different world, once again, tons of issues. The main one is actually a pretty strange one. When moving between scenes, the objects were for some reason not being destroyed. I thought this was strange, but it was an easy fix, just manually destroy all the objects in the list. But only later did I realize what was actually going on in the background. The issue is because the network object spawn function, that one for some reason defaults to false on destroy on load. I have no idea why false is the default here. This is the completely opposite for every default on every other game object. Any other game object, by default, if you don't tell it to survive between loads, it won't get destroyed. But for some reason on network objects, the default behavior was worse. So by default, network objects will persist between scene changes, so that was the issue here. But again, after figuring out, the solution is super simple. Just set it to false to make sure that it destroys on load and everything works. So once again, I got everything working, no errors, the players could now change worlds. Okay, great. 
But once again, another sneaky issue popped up that once again broke everything. This time the issue was on the save system. If I started in one world, then changed to the other world, then made a save and loaded that save, if I did that, everything worked. But if I started on one world, then I did not go to the other one and I just saved right there and unloaded that save file. At that point, when I loaded again and moved on to the second world, now everything would break. This was another really tricky issue that again took tons of time, tons of logging to figure out what was the cause. It turns out the issue has to do with JSON. Now JSON is really awesome. It is excellent for making save files super easily. But since it is text-based, it has some weird quirks with how it regards nulls or empty objects. The issue ended up being that if I first moved to another world, then it would basically generate the data for both those worlds. But if I never made that change, when I saved just on the first world, when I did that, basically it would save the second world as a null object. Now in my case, I assumed that was going to happen, so I made a simple null check, but it turns out that JSON automatically serialized the object, so it does not actually save it as null. So it was actually saving for basically a initialized object on all on zero. So for example, on DHQ, it saved the position on 000, it had the default type and so on, so basically the object was not null, but then for the actual HQ object data, that data was completely empty. So when I went to load, obviously everything breaks. Solution here was basically just setting a check, not just checking if the object is null itself, but check the contents and make sure they are not the complete defaults. So yet another issue that was really tricky to find, but I did manage to find it and fix it. After all those errors and bugs, finally everything was working. I could create a game in either single player or multiplayer. I could jump to any worm that I want. And the world data is perfectly saved, so if I go from world A to world B, then come back, everything is exactly as I left it. And if the host travels, then all the clients load along with them. So this was definitely tricky, as you can see, lots of bugs, but in the end, I finally got it working. Then it was just a matter of making it work in-game instead of using a debug key. Again, this was pretty easy. The rocket already exists in the world. It already has the building stages and all of that. So I just made a new window in order to select destination of where I want to travel to. Then I made some slightly different environments for different worlds. Pretty much just changed the color just to make them visually different. Obviously, I still have to build out these actual worlds. Then I also added some logic in order to be able to carry the crate container contents, be able to carry those as the rocket travels to another planet. This is going to be super important because not every world has every resource. So in the final game, you're going to need to coordinate the logistics between different planets in order to make sure you have all resources in all planets. So with that, this mechanic is working. However, some of you might be noticed, there's actually two very glaring flaws. Number one is how exactly do you automate moving resources from planet A to planet B if the player is the one that has to manually initiate the rocket movement? And that leads to problem number two, which is what happens to the planets when you're not on there? Right now, they are just static, so once you get back, it just loads the save exactly as it was before, so it's as if time was frozen. Whereas you would think, okay, shouldn't time really continue moving on as you're in another planet? And the answer is, of course it should, so that is something that I absolutely need to implement. That is the next really complex task that I need to work on. And right now, I honestly have no idea how I'm going to implement that. The code really wasn't set up to be able to have dummy objects and real objects. So I'll have to figure out, okay, how can I generalize the logic so I don't have to do a bunch of copy pasting? Maybe I can just spawn the objects in a separate world that does not impact the first world. So I don't know, that is definitely going to be really complex, but it has to be done. That is a crucial mechanic for the game. Obviously the machines do need to continue working in order to transfer resources between the worlds. So yeah, that is definitely going to be a very tricky task, but once again, I'm confident that whatever errors I find, I'll be able to fix them, and in the end, I'll be able to get that mechanic working. If you want to try out the game with this update, go ahead and check out the free demo, as well as add the game to your wishlist. Alright, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.